Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bissell, did you say that still 40% of your uh, energy is from oil? 30% currently. Yep. So you still are 30% dependent on oil. Um, and uh, Mr. Ness, so those policies that you were talking about with uh, Senator King, formerly Governor King, he and I worked together as governors too, and he's been out to North Dakota, so he, he's, uh, you know, he's good at advocating his point, but he's also open-minded uh, when you work with him on things, and that's much appreciated. Um, so those policies, though, uh, again, even uh, in Kauai, they're 30% still dependent on oil, all the way out there in beautiful Hawaii. We were at 13 million barrels a day. Now we're down to about 11.5 million barrels a day. <clears throat> in North Dakota, we were at 1.5 million barrels a day. Now we're 1.1 million. That's 400,000 of that million five we're down right now. And it is those policies that are preventing us from sustaining and growing energy production in first question in places like North Dakota isn't that correct and second don't those policies hit your smaller companies even harder than the than the bigger companies Senator Hovind I, and your point is well taken and, and certainly uh, in the Bakken you know we have a, a large mix of, of oil and gas producers uh, many of them are, are small regional independent oil and gas producers who who completely rely on investment capital uh, they don't have the reserves. They don't have the type of production that, that warrants the, the revenue generation. They need to go out to the street. They need to find that money, and they need to, uh, you know, find a positive reaction on the state in their response to their solicitations, essentially, uh, to grow production, grow Bakken production. And the, what they're seeing from the banks, what they're seeing from investors is hesitancy. And I, I directly attribute that back to something that is fixable. There's a fix to this, and we need we need the all of the above energy policy grow all production of all resources. And that's really what you're saying is it is about all of the above to truly make us energy secure, energy independent, and that that base load is is a vital part of it as well, right? One hundred percent. We we completely rely on on reliable, affordable electricity in, in our state for uh, not only to run our oil and gas operations, but certainly as a state we have a. Uh, you know, we're growing all types of production, but we're going to need it in this country. We need to grow production. And you work hard on the environmental stewardship. As a matter of fact, you would say your industry is really a leader globally in terms of environmental stewardship, wouldn't you? Uh, the advancements that we've made in just the last three to five years are, are simply amazing on the emission reductions, uh, our, our gas capture technologies. Uh, I was sharing with Senator Hickenlooper earlier, a Denver company has come up with an incredible, we're powering the cloud now, uh, making Bitcoin off of some of the remote well locations. Uh, incredible strides on the advancement, three mile laterals versus two mile laterals. And yes, so uh, the reductions in the emissions that we've seen making that Bakken barrel, I think the cleanest barrel in the world. And when we talk about production on federal lands, you do need access to those leases because even if, you know, even if companies have some leases, if they're held up because they can't get drilling permits or they're held up in litigation, they can't produce those leases, correct? So they need to be able to bid for more of those leases. And in fact, when those leases have been offered, haven't the companies gone out and aggressively bid for more of those leases? Uh, Senator Hoven, yes, we saw um, the leasehold this last uh this last cycle, uh, about 80% of that was taken off the market, but 20% of the leases, uh, despite paying, paying a 50% you know, higher royalty, we saw a lot of interest in those leases. But the uniqueness in North Dakota, and pursuant to your bill, Senate Bill 4227, uh, we've got a lot of private land with a very small de minimis federal, federal lease under it. If you don't have that federal lease, despite whether the federal government doesn't own any of the surface, may own a very small percentage of the, of the mineral interest, you can't continue to move forward with that lease and drill that prospect uh, until you have that federal lease. So it'd be kind of like Mr. Bissell owning some property in Kauai that he couldn't develop, even though he owned all of the surface rights and the majority of the mineral rights, but the federal government owned a minority of the uh, of mineral rights and no surface rights. They could hold him up, whether he liked electricity or anything else, right? And, Senator, that hurts the, uh, the, the service owner, that hurts the mineral owner, that hurts the royalty owner, that hurts the state, the county, the townships. Uh, but primarily, I, I think these are, these are significant world-class oil wells that could immediately bring oil production online and grow our, our, 
our production and, and lower the price of energy and in our country. And a fundamental question of private property rights, right? Correct. Madam Chair, I have some more questions, but I'll defer back to you at this Thank point. You. Thank you, Senator Hovacet. Um, so, uh, Ms. Fedorchek, um, obviously the, the country's needs for electricity are, are going to continue to grow, whether it's computers or cars or anything else. Where is that electricity going to come from? And where is it going to come from on a reliable basis if we don't maintain our base load from all sources, including coal-fired uh, electricity? Absolutely. Thank you, Senator Hovind, for that uh, question. I thought I was going to get off really easy. Nope. <laughs> nope. I knew the chairman would come back, but she had a few things to All right. Uh, you raise a very good point, and I think that uh, several members have mentioned the need for the all of strategy, and that really is very extremely important. The most important thing to remember, you can compare uh, electricity on price all day long, but every megawatt is not created equal, and you have to have dispatchable power. Unless you just want the power when the sun is blowing, the, or, or, or the sun is shining, the wind is blowing, and nobody wants that. So. Uh, Senator King hit it right. We need battery storage. We don't have that yet. And you can't compare a place like Hawaii to a place like North Dakota. Hawaii has about maximum, I think I looked it up, 2,000 heating degree days. North Dakota has 8,000 to 10,000 heating degree days. So I think even Mr. Bissell would agree that what's needed and possible in the electric grid in Hawaii is very different from what is capable in the state of North Dakota where we get temperature swings from minus 20 to minus 30 degrees in the winter to 115 degrees in the summer. So, you know, the electric grid has to adapt to that. It has to adapt every second with the exact amount of electricity that's needed. And the technology simply doesn't exist today to make that possible with 100% renewables. We have to have dispatchable resources fueled by our fossil fuels for the indefinite future until technology uh, allows us to wean off from those. So, you know, one of the things that we're working on very aggressively, in not only in North Dakota but other states as well, is things like carbon capture and storage. And working on that both for geologic storage but also for tertiary uh, oil recovery. Again, leading the world in good environmental stewardship while producing more energy more cost effectively and more dependably. What are the key things that you, and, and your point about a federal one-size-fits-all does not work. I think you made that uh, very clear when you talk about North Dakota and Hawaii, both doing some really great things. What are some of the keys that will, in terms of federal policy, that will really help advance carbon capture and storage? Thank you, Senator Hovind. Well, first of all, there has to be a um, commitment by the administration and other federal agencies that coal is the future. Coal is a fuel that we are going to invest in for the future. It's important not just for America, it's important for the world. So we should be leading the efforts to develop that technology here, perfect it, use it in places like North Dakota, apply it in places like India, China, other countries in the world, because this is a global problem. Um, so you know, the 45Q tax credit that the Senate and uh, was included recently last fall, uh, passed by all of you and supported. That's huge to support those investments. There's some really big projects occurring in North Dakota. Project Tundra is one that is going to be a commercial scale, um, hopefully coal-fired facility with 100% carbon capture and storage. That's really exciting. There's other big coal plants in North Dakota pursuing the same technology. So I believe that that technology can be proven in North Dakota. And those massive generating units, 1,100 megawatts, 600, 700 megawatts of dispatchable power that is invaluable in the winter throughout the country, throughout the MISO region, those will be sustainable long term with that new technology. So these things really can fit together when you look at solar or wind and its intermittent nature, then producing oil and gas. Uh, Kauai still has 30 percent oil reliance. Combining these things with carbon capture technologies, all these things can come together in a way that makes us stronger if we don't get stuck on this one size fits all from a federal perspective, right? And that we provide the flexibility and the opportunity for traditional sources of energy as well as uh, some of the renewables, right? On a fair basis. 
Absolutely, that's the, the main thing I think we're hearing right. from the grid operators, do we have to have them all? Yeah, and a final question for uh, Mr. Ness. Isn't it the case that now if we're not producing that oil and gas here at home, we end up getting it from our adversaries, places like, and, and the, the world, not just us, but the world, whether it's Russia or Venezuela or even the Middle East OPEC. Isn't that the case? Senator Hoban, uh, our, our world needs, needs energy every single day, and the world is going to supply that oil, and we absolutely are uh, advocating for and, and supporting our enemies and uh, others by not producing American energy. So it's really, an, this is a national security issue as well as an economic issue for our country. This is 100 percent a national geopolitical issue, and the ability to supply our friends and allies in Europe and across the country with energy uh, is the single greatest opportunity we have to ensure that we've got uh, national security and, and some opportunities going forward in those nations. Yeah, and I would also, along with the Chairman, like to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. Appreciate it.